All right, everyone, good evening. It is Tuesday, August 20th, 2024. We are calling our uh, meeting of the Wake County Board of Education to order. It is 542. I want to welcome those of you who are watching at home and those of you who are here in person. Wake County Board of Education meetings are conducted for the official business of the school system. The public is cordially invited to attend board meetings to observe the board as it conducts its official business. Disruptions by any persons or persons of a public meeting will be subject to action in accordance with North Carolina General Statute 143, 318.17. I note that we do have all of our members today. We do have a quorum. And so I'd like to ask everyone who's able to rise as we recite the Pledge of Allegiance. All right, so now in our first meeting following some recent policy changes, we will uh, we have a new meeting agenda order. So the first item that we have today is the approval of our meeting agenda. Board Chair, I'd like to um, request that we move um, or add an action item. Okay, there's a motion from Ms. Caulfield to add an action agenda item. Can you discuss? Can you tell me the item and where on the agenda you would like to add it? Um, I would like to put it in action and to discuss the Title IX changes in light of the new Supreme Court decision that affects that it could have on us. Okay. Does that, has everyone heard? Oops. And has everyone heard and does everyone understand the motion? Is there a second? Okay, we have a second from Dr. Ring. Is there any discussion? So is this where we discuss it or I'm waiting for everyone no, no, to say what this, this is just a discussion yeah. about the motion. Okay. So if, if anyone had any questions or discussion about the motion, if not, we'll take a vote. Okay. So I just wanted to explain that the reason that I was asking it, if I, if I could do that now, and I just wanted to make a motion to the board um, that we consider having a topic or consider repealing our last update to the Title, po Title IX policy to hold off until the courts is settled and stand with the 26 other states that are doing so in light of the changes that the Supreme Court had ruled on. Okay, thank you, Ms. Caulfield. Is there any other discussion? Um, what I would like to do as the chair is I respect where you're coming from and I appreciate you letting me know about the motion just before the meeting. For a discussion like that, I would like board, meet, board members to have adequate time to prepare so that we can have a full discussion. And so I'm going to vote no on the motion, but I understand why you brought it, and that's not to rule out a future conversation. All right. Is there any other discussion or debate? Dr. Ng. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think um, just in light of, I mean, it's constantly changing. And so, I mean, what, what we discussed today may even change again um, in the next time we have a d discussion. So I think um, um, we do need to kind of look at whether um, uh, set setting something static, a policy that's static in the midst of a continuing changing um, uh, environment is wise. So that's something that I just wanted to throw out there. I appreciate that. All right. Any further discussion? All right, all in favor of amending our meeting agenda to add the action item that Ms. Caulfield described on Title IX, please signify by saying aye. aye. Any opposed? Aye. Nay. All right, I believe the motion failed, but uh, thank you. And we can discuss bringing up the topic on the agenda after the meeting, okay? okay. All right, thank you, Ms. Caulfield. At this point in time, we do still have a meeting agenda pending. Is there a motion from the board? So moved. Second. I have a motion from Vice Chair Johnson Hostler and a second from Mr. Swanson. All in favor of adoption of the meeting agenda signify by saying aye. aye. Any opposed? All right. The agenda has passed and we will proceed. So now under our new meeting agenda schedule, we go to our information items and public comment period. Today, 
We have no information items or special recognitions brought to the board, so we'll go straight into public comment. As we do each time, I'm going to go through our policy regarding public comment. Speakers commenting on items on the night's agenda will be heard before speakers commenting on other topics. All other speakers will be heard in order of sign-up. Only the person speaking at the podium will be able to stand. Again, all attendees that are not speaking, we ask to remain seated. Members of the public are welcome to offer comments and criticism directed at the substantive ideas, actions, or procedures of the board and individual board members. The laws and policies of North Carolina provide that issues or concerns involving individual personnel and individual student matters are confidential and therefore not appropriate for comment, public comment settings. These, those offering comments to the board, including students, may discuss items and issues of general concern. Now, if you do have concerns related to personnel issues or individual student matters, these may be addressed through applicable WCPSS personnel, the grievance policies, or their applicable policies. And if it is a time-sensitive issue, hopefully we can direct you to a staff member here who can talk to you and hear, hear from you directly. In the interest of maintaining civility and decorum, speakers are encouraged to address their comments to the Board of Education, those of us up at this table, and must refrain from personal attacks and insults directed at the board, individual board members, staff, and specifically other speakers and members of the general public. Please remain at the podium uh, during your speaking time, and any materials you wish to share to the board can be given to our board attorney, Mr. Malone, here at the end of the table, either before or after your comments, and that will not cut into your time. During public comment, you may speak for up to three minutes. The microphones are adjustable. Go ahead and adjust them before you get started. That Your time will not start until you begin speaking. Then, when you do begin speaking, you'll see the green light at the podium illuminate. You'll then have three minutes. When you see a yellow light and you hear the first audible tone, that's your, that's your notice that you've got 30 seconds remaining. Um, the next time you see a light, when it turns red, you'll hear another, a second audible tone. That is when your time is up and the next speaker is going to be called to the podium. Speakers are asked to respect the time limit and to speak for no more than three minutes, and you may choose to speak for less time. So um, the other thing I did not say in that regarding our policy is that by our new, newly amended policy, we give students a priority to speak first. We do have uh, one student here today, uh, Rowan Billado, and so I'll call Rowan up. And then we have no off agenda, well, sorry. Then uh, Rowan will be followed by Margaret Billado. Good evening. Today I want to talk about mental health and bullying, something that the board says is very important to them. I want to further address something I've mentioned in passing, which is my experience with bullying as well as admin at Willow Spring High School. To be quite frank, calling it bullying is an understatement. I have been the victim of verbal, physical, and sexual harassment and assault. I have in fact been a victim of terrorism, which is defined by Britannica as the calculated use of violence to create a general climate of fear and thereby bring about a particular pol political objective. Terrorism at its core is the use of threat or the use or threat of violence to inflict fear and further compel people to conform. I started at that school just a few days before Thanksgiving break, and every day since day one I've had issues. People calling me slurs, taking pictures of me, threatening to kill me, recording me in the bathroom, throwing bananas at me, asking if they can solicit sex from me, trying to grab me and kiss me, actually grabbing me, throwing things at me, spitting on me, hitting me with their tray in the middle of the lunch line, etc. And I reported almost every single one of those incidents. I think they had to start printing out more incident sheets because of me. I rarely heard anything back aside from so-and-so was given a verbal warning. There was an incident near the end of the school year where I was physically assaulted. I was in the lunch line and somebody stepped out of line, came up from behind me, and hit me with their tray. Assault is defined as the act of causing physical harm or unwanted physical contact, or in some cases, the threat or attempt to do so. However, I was told by an admin at my school that it was plainly and simply not assault, and that labeling it as such makes the word lose its meaning. Before making a report of this incident, I texted my mom and asked her what I should do. She told me to go to the SRO because assault is handled by police. So I went to the front office and asked the receptionist if I could speak to the SRO. She said, they're all busy right now, but you can talk to admin, and she asked what it was regarding. To which I replied that I needed to report being assaulted, and she was adamant that I just speak to admin. I approached the first admin I saw, explained the situation, and was asked if maybe the guy just had a crush on me. So I found a different admin who told me to go to student services and write a report. 
Later that day, my mom told me that she had notified Fuqua police about the incident, and our hope was that they'd take it from there. Moments later, I was called to the admin's office. She told me that she reviewed the camera footage, which she also showed to me. She told me that she had spoken to my mom and explained the situation, and then she told me that my report was inaccurate. She said I exaggerated, but that she wasn't upset because she understands that I'm just hypersensitive. I explained to her that I wasn't exaggerating and that this situation fell under the definition of assault as stated in NC Statute 1433. But I was again told that I wasn't that it wasn't assault and that I overstated in my report. She also told me that every admin reviewed the footage and agreed with her. Once I decided to agree and say I exaggerated, she let me leave. Interestingly, she only communicated with my mom after that conversation, which is against policy and the law if I'm not mistaken. So the guy who hit me got off scot-free and I got off with Im intimidation, fear, and a severe loss of trust in admin. All of this happened under Title IX before the changes, so I'm hoping that the modifications can help in the encounters I know I'll experience this year and maybe I can finally feel protected at school. Thank you. And I have some things for you guys. All right, thank you. Next up, we'll hear from Margaret Billado. And, oops, excuse me one second. I lost my list here. I had two different lists. Here we go. Uh, Ms. Billado will be followed by Jocelyn Peace. Hello, good evening to the superintendent and school board members. As a parent of mostly older children, um, I've had the privilege of watching my kids grow into thoughtful, compassionate, and independent people. I've also had the responsibility of guiding them through a world that isn't always fair or just. And that's why I'm here today, to speak in support of the new Title IX rules and to advocate for the protection of all of our students without exception. I'll begin by clearing up a common misconception. Uh, the vast majority of the new Title IX rules have nothing to do with transgender rights. These updates are designed to clarify and strengthen how existing Title IX claims should be handled. They include important measures to assist affected parties, set clear requirements for employee notification, and outline the duties of Title IX coordinators. They also establish set grievance procedures and ensure the protection of personal, personally identifiable information. These are administrative improvements that make our schools safer and more equitable for everyone especially in colleges where we have a rape crisis epidemic. The new rules go further by addressing critical areas that have long needed attention. They strengthen protections for pregnant and postpartum students and employees, requiring access to lactation spaces and reasonable accommodations like restroom breaks for pregnant students. They also offer more support for student parents, ensuring that our schools accommodate the unique challenges these students face. In addition, these rules allow foster parents and other authorized caregivers to legally represent minors, making sure that our most vulnerable students have the advocacy they need. Quite importantly, these rules prohibit schools from retaliating against students who file Title IX complaints, creating a safer environment for everyone to speak out against discrimination. I'm deeply concerned by the way some have used the issue of transgender rights to undermine these important protections. The reality is that attacking trans youth does nothing to address the real problems facing women and girls. In fact, it distracts from the work that still needs to be done. Every student, no matter their identity, should be able to learn in a safe, inclusive, and equitable environment. Every young person deserves the opportunity to access a public education without fear of discrimination because of who they are. We don't all have to agree on every issue, and I certainly don't ex expect us to. My own children and I don't see eye to eye on everything, and we advocate for different positions sometimes. But what we do agree on is the right of every person to hold their own beliefs and have those beliefs respected. Part of parenting kids is teaching them to think critically, to question, and yes, to sometimes disagree. But above all, I've tried to instill in them the understanding that no one deserves to be treated unfairly simply because they're different. This is not a conversation about transgender rights. It's about who we can and cannot discriminate against on the basis of sex. Why should we discriminate against anyone? Who is it okay to bully? Who is it okay to discriminate against? The answer should be simple, no one. Until we can, as a society, accept that no one truly means no one, we will continue to need explicit explanations and protections like those provided by new Title IX. In the United States, we've needed constitutional amendments to ban slavery, indenture servitude, to eliminate racial discrimination in voting, and to secure voting rights regardless of sex. We have had to historically explicitly define who is entitled to equality. All right, thank you. Our next speaker is Jocelyn Peace, followed by Joseph Deaton. Good evening. So, oh, hey, good evening. Sorry. <laughs> I'm a little okay. bit nervous. Uh, seclusion is the most dangerous and ineffective tool you can give an educator. It is meant for serious emergencies. 
Experts say it is most often used for noncompliance with staff demands, disruption, punishment, or program requirements, just like some Wake County employees informed me and dozens of Wake special ed parents have also told me was their experience. Wake has a problem to solve with its restraint and seclusion and also a sneaky thing called timeout. This is a seclusion room. I get it right. This is a seclusion room. Seclusion is the involuntary confinement of a student alone in a room or an area in which the student is prevented from leaving. This is an extreme procedure with serious risks and should be rare, according to experts in the U.S. Department of Education and Department of Justice. In Wake County, seclusion rooms like this have been referred to as timeout, the calm down room, the quiet room, and the rainbow room. These are actual timeout rooms, calm down rooms, and rainbow rooms. Timeout is a voluntary behavioral support strategy where the student is temporarily separated from the learning activity for the purpose of calming. The space needs to be appropriate for the purpose of calming. Being alone in a closet is not calming for anyone. An empty closet is not a support strategy. It is imperative that you create a policy for seclusion that clearly defines and separates seclusion from timeout. There should be no confusion over whether a child is experiencing a calming timeout or a life-altering seclusion. Districts should never be able to incorrectly classify seclusions as timeouts in order to report, avoid reporting to parents or federal authorities. If it's involuntary, it's seclusion. If restraint was used on the child to get to the room, it's seclusion. That comes directly from the trial lawyers at the United States Department of Justice. This is not a sensory room. This is not a chill out room. This is trauma. What would you think if you were told that your child spent time in the rainbow room? Would you know to get them help? You cannot and should not use the same room and the same terms for seclusion and timeout. Change policy 4302, ban seclusion at least in elementary schools, you don't need it, and change the culture of restraint and seclusion in Wake County. Every single person in front of me is a problem solver. You would not be here if you weren't. We can do better. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Joseph Deaton. And Mr. Deaton will be followed by Robin Livingston. Good evening. Uh, at the last meeting, Mr. Hershey decried how a female boxer at the Olympics was labeled as transgender when she was not. Apparently, she has a rare genetic anomaly known as a developmental sex disorder or intersex condition. I totally agree such persons should be treated with uh, sensitivity and, and respect. Um, but I, I think it's highly insensitive, disrespectful, and in, inappropriate to use their condition, which they have from nature, to justify transgenderism because that involves a profound alteration of nature. Mr. Hershey didn't say that. but. Um, intersex is often wrongly included in LGBTQIA+. Meanwhile, the opening ceremony at the Olympics featured a drag queen mockery of, of the Last Supper. I don't see how one group attacking another could be shown in the name of inclusion. It immediately reminded me of the French Revolution when a prostitute was seated on the altar in Notre Dame Cathedral and hailed as the goddess of, of reason. That was followed by the murder of thousands of priests, lay people, and even religious sisters during the reign of terror. A genocide of 200,000 men, women, and children was committed in the Vendée region when people resisted closing their churches. Soon, Napoleon became dictator. Our, our history curriculum should include a comparison of the French 
and the American Revolution. In France, leading intellectuals like Voltaire relentlessly mocked religion, whereas leaders of the American Revolution valued religion for inculcating the virtues that were necessary for a people to govern themselves. A key biblical principle was the practice of impartial justice balanced with mercy. Another was rule by consent of the government, of the governed. Liberty in the, in the French Revolution meant freedom to do whatever you want, while in America, liberty was freedom with responsibility to others. And finally, slavery was first abolished in Christian cultures that pondered the implications of rational human nature created in the image of God, in particular the inalienable rights listed in the Declaration of Independence. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Deaton. Our next speaker is Robin Livingston, and uh, Robin will be followed by Nicole Baldridge. Good evening. Um, I've got a junior at Wake Young Men's Leadership Academy, and I primarily came up here to thank Mr. Hersey for all the work that he did. Um, they started school on the 8th, 7th, I'm not sure, anyway, um, and started college classes last Thursday, and it has gone by so well uh, for him and I assume for others. Um, for I, I know most of you probably know, uh, a lot of us parents went through a lot of anxiety from about March on, and um, Mr. Hershey uh, had Zoom calls with us and was just very transparent about the process. Um, if he didn't know something, he got the answer, um, or he told us what the process was going to be to get the answer, and um, we just all really, really appreciated his openness, his, his transparency, his willingness to be honest about it when there was a problem. Um, I did ask some people on a group me if they wanted to share some comments. I've got a few. <laughs> um, so one person, I won't do names um, since, anyway. One said um, they wanted to let you know just how amazing and transparent you were, making yourself available to any and all throughout the whole process. One said, um, that the fact that you were honest throughout the process, willing to see the process to the end, offered and received a variety of solutions and gave families a plant platform to be heard. Even if information wasn't always shared in the most loving and kind and respectful or level-headed manner in the heat of the moment, you gave them space for families to voice what they needed and ensured there was direction to keep us moving toward our goal. Um, that person has a 10th grader, so they were they weren't even really directly affected by the changes um, yet. <laughs> um, and then one of them was appreciative of the fact that you kind of explained the relationship between DPI and the le legislature and gave us a direction and where to go. Um, so we really appreciate uh, everything and I, I just the staff at the academies as well, amazing job that they did doing the uh, transition and they get to do it again. So. They've got a lot of work ahead of them, but um, I think we're all in really good hands, so I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Our next speaker is Nicole Baldridge, and Nicole will be followed by Natalie Wood. Hi, uh, Nicole Baldridge. I am a proud parent of a student at Apex Friendship High School and a former teacher of 14 years, um, three of those years in Wake County and the rest of those in California before I moved here. Um, I want to talk about two things. One, thank you so much for all that you have done to increase teacher supplement in Wake County. I know that our staff appreciate it. However, as you know, it's, it's not enough. Um, I've talked to several teachers who, because of where they are on the pay scale of, of years, if they are 15 or more years, they're not really seeing an increase in pay because pay is frozen, and that includes the supplement. Um, and then because of cost of insurance, they're actually making less money. Their take home pay is less this year than it was last year. For some of them, it's $96 less take home than it was last year. And with inflation being over 3%, that's even more of an 
actual pay cut that they are experiencing. I know many teachers are working three or more jobs just to make ends meet. This means that they're not spending or able to spend the time that they need on their students. I know that teaching is an incredibly demanding job. It is one that we are passionate about. It is one that we love. We care for our students deeply and we take that home with us. This includes lesson planning. This includes going to the store and buying the things that our students need out of our own money. Um, I was a science teacher. That's meant I went and I bought supplies for doing labs. I taught high school. and. Many of those labs I funded out of my pocket. Um, if we wanted to do something, which I made it a goal to do a lab every week, I bought those things. I brought them in. If a student needed a pen or a pencil and we didn't have it and they couldn't get it, I got it for them. There are resources available, but it's not enough. And I am encouraging, I'm here to encourage you, if you have not already as a board, to sign the letter that Charlotte Mecklenburg Schools Board of Education is sending to the legislator to encourage the NC General Assembly to increase teacher pay across the board. Because as we know, you can only do so much and you've done it and you've reached out to the County Commission and we appreciate that. But we need the legislator to do something too. We need them to move. Um, the budget that they passed in 2023 is not enough. And you know that. I'm preaching to the choir. It's not enough. It's not enough for teacher pay. It's not enough for... For bus drivers, it's, it's just not enough. Um, so I encourage you, if you have not already, as a board, to sign that letter so that there will be more people on that letter. And I had other things, but we only have two, 22 seconds. So thank you. Thank you, Ms. Baldridge. Our final speaker tonight is Natalie Wood. Good evening, Ms. Wood. Good evening. How are you? Doing well. Thank you. Um, I come before you tonight regarding a matter of school transfer of my son, Isaiah Gill. I received a letter from Mr. Ambergo from the Wake County School Assignment stating that recently the Office of Student Assignment was informed and confirmed that I was not domiciled in Wake County. And as a result of the information, our office has gathered Josiah and Nathan and they will be withdrawn from the Wake County Public Schools at the end of the school year. Please make arrangements to enroll your child in your county of residence for the 24-25 school year. My first concern is that my son has been out of school since July 8th of 2024. He is on track two at Holly Grove Middle School. This means he has been denied a right to an education because the Office of Student Assignment has got me into this cycle of asking for paperwork and poor communication. They have not been concerned about my child's education. Because the, later, the letter stated they were informed and confirmed, I became suspicious, especially because I am a whistleblower with the North Carolina Department of Justice. Also, I never got a chance to explain why he was there. There was no due process. Most importantly, it was never written that Isaiah would be reassigned. I want to introduce Isaiah to the Wake County board members. He is the most important reason why I am here. I need for Isaiah to be back in school and Isaiah needs to be back in school. He has missed out on so much of his education from July up until today. Isaiah is a 13 year old eighth grade student at Holly Grove Middle School. Isaiah is not your average child who is into phones and games. He, his interest is in music and he has done excellent, receiving the Excellence in Band Award. He scored a three in math and a four in ELA on his EOGs. He is an honor roll student and he presents no disciplinary problems. I want to and deserve and I want to see Isaiah back and he deserves to be back in school. Isaiah is going to be famous one day because he is a gifted musician. I don't want him missing opportunities to be great. My ask to the board is to give him grace and mercy. This is Isaiah's last year at Holly Grove Middle School. My ask to the board would be to please allow him to complete this school year. I, Isaiah does not want to miss his jazz band audition, which is August 21st and 22nd, which is tomorrow and Thursday. He has had a lot of anxiety around this. It would be cruel and heartless to deny him the opportunity that he has worked so hard for. 
please allow him to stay to finish his last year so he can move on. All right. Thank you, Ms. Thank Wood. You. All right. That concludes our public comment period. And so now what we'll do is we will go to our superintendent, Dr. Robert Taylor, for his comments this evening. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and good evening to you all. I'd like to start by congratulating the semifinalists for principal and assistant principal of the year. Uh, this year, there are a total of 36 semifinalists divided into four categories, elementary school principals, elementary school assistant principals, secondary principals, and secondary school assistant principals. Each category has one semifinalist from each of the nine areas of our district. Full list of the semifinalists can be found on the Wake County Public Schools team Facebook page. We will announce five principals and five assistant principals as finalists on Friday, and the chair will have to make that decision. That is a joke. <laughs> finalists will submit a portfolio, then a committee of principals and assistant principals will visit each school site. Finalists also will be interviewed by a panel that includes past winners. The 2024 Principal of the Year and Assistant Principal of the Year will be named on October the 3rd, so please mark your calendars. It goes without saying that passionate and effective school leaders are integral to student success. They set the tone at their schools by creating positive, uplifting learning environments, and they work hard supporting students, families, and staff whenever the need arises. These semifinalists embody all of these ideals and more. So my congratulations to them and my thanks to all of our outstanding school leaders. Next, I'm pleased to announce that our Child Nutrition Services team has landed a $250,000 USDA grant uh, to implement, yes, yes, to implement a new fresh fruit and vegetable program at seven of our schools. The fresh fruits and veg veggies will be served to all enrolled students in their classrooms on select school days each week. The goal is to introduce students to fresh fruits and vegetables, including new and different varieties, and to increase overall acceptance and consumption of fresh, unprocessed produce. The majority of the offerings will consist of items that students may not be familiar with or have a chance to eat often, such as sugar snap peas, red pepper slices, mango, persimmons, and star fr fruit. Uh, when we are able, we'll provide locally grown produce as well. The participating schools are Averysboro Elementary, Carver Elementary, East Garner Elementary, Fox Road Magnet Elementary, Lead Mine Elementary, Millbrook Magnet Elementary, and Wakelon Elementary. We know that proper nutrition is essential to keeping students alert, focused, and ready to learn. Uh, my thanks to everyone who put in the effort to secure funds for this unique program that will promote healthy choices for thousands of students. And I'll just add that um, our board has done an outstanding job to support uh, school nutrition efforts and we continue in that work. Finally, I'd like to recognize 16 of our magnet schools for achieving the high honor of national certification by Magnet Schools of America. The certification process includes a rigorous evaluation that determines how well schools meet the standards associated with MSA's five pillars of magnet schools, which are diversity, innovative curriculum and professional development, academic excellence, leadership, and family and community partnerships. Four schools met the criteria to be named national certified schools, Fuller Magnet Elementary, Lincoln Heights Magnet Elementary, Martin Magnet Middle, and the Wake Young Men's Leadership Academy. Twelve schools exceeded that criteria to be named national certified demonstration schools. Carroll Magnet Middle, Fox Road Magnet Elementary, Green Magnet Elementary, Kingswood Magnet Elementary, North Wake College and Career Academy, Oberlin Magnet Middle, Reedy Creek Magnet Middle, Underwood Magnet Elementary, Vernon Malone College and Career Academy, Wake Early College of Health and Science, Washington Magnet Elementary, and West Millbrook Magnet Middle. Uh, certification is last for four years. Uh, these schools join 25 other Wake County Magnet schools that have previously attained certification. This is just the latest reminder that our Magnet schools are a national model of excellence. Our Magnet programs continue to find new and innovative curricula to meet the evolving needs of our students and the job market. 
while promoting diverse student populations. So special thanks to uh, Joshua Hunter from our Office of Magnet and Curriculum Enhancement Programs for guiding these schools through the rigorous application process and to the administrators and magnet coordinators at each of these newly certified schools. So again, congratulations on this richly deserved honor. And uh, Mr. Chair, that will end my comments. All right, thank you, Dr. Taylor. Uh, board members, if you look around the table, you should see a flyer with uh, North Carolina School Boards Association news on it. I wanted to draw that to your attention. This is another training and professional development opportunity we have uh, available through the association. This is the Leadership Education and Development Training, their lead training program. I know that several of us have attended this in the past. I think everyone who has attended it has spoken well of it, that it was a very uh, uh, worthwhile use of our time and a very good use of the program for you know we all have continuing education requirements uh, each year and so if you have not fulfilled those requirements I wanted to draw this uh, opportunity to your attention as a as an affordable local option um, and just encourage you to consider checking it out so thank you everybody it's good to be back at this table the last time we met as a board was actually at the county commission table where we had our joint meeting with the Wake County Commissioners. Um, I know being on a Monday night, we didn't have, op we had some professional, op some professional conflicts for some of our board members, but thanks to everyone who came and participated. We had good discussions about sustainability, joint uh, goals and targets around sustainability goals for our schools. We talked about school security. Um, <clears throat> a lot of areas of cooperation with the county in those areas. And then uh, a, we talked a lot, I think our primary topic was our child nutrition program and interest in the county and work that we can do there. So um, I just wanna take a minute to acknowledge our county commissioner partners and this spirit of cooperation. We really are lucky when you look at districts around the state and some of the very combative relationships they might have at the very least non-cooperative relationships. I think here, when we can all get around the table together, even if we're not bringing an agenda item or anything to vote on, just be able to talk about these issues, discuss them in an open forum, I think that's a good way to get things done. Um, I know some of you, um, I'm not gonna talk about the ribbon cutting at Woods Creek, but I was happy to be there. Coming up, we opened a new elementary school and we had another opportunity um, I had to participate in. Mr. Swanson works with several of our other local elected officials, state legislators, county commissioners, to do a series of town halls. And uh, he was unable to attend this last one. I had to substitute for him. But it was a fascinating program on affordable housing in our community. And one of the things that um, really struck me is that when our county and our municipal staff are looking at issues of home prices and affordability in their towns and in Wake County, they look at you know all of our residents and they particularly pulled out examples of first year teachers in Wake County and bus drivers, two positions you know we're working hard to recruit and to fill. So I wanted to share these numbers with you. Um, I don't believe the town hall was recorded so but if we could get these slides like from the staff, they would be excellent. I think you would all appreciate them. A first year certified Wake County teacher makes about $57,098. What we calculate using the federal funding formulas for an affordable housing cost, monthly housing cost, would be about $1,427. So anything above that would be outside of affordable housing, all right? So you're looking at housing you could get for that rental price, um, or then if you take it out to what a mortgage payment would be under current interest rates, what a purchase price would be. So if you look at a $1,427 a month rent in Cary, that's only 24% of the open available units, 210, in all of Cary. If you look at Wake County as a whole, there's, 16, there's 1,671 units, but again, only 24% of those units on the market are affordable to our first year teachers. If you wanted to buy a home and start you know, uh, building equity in a property, there are currently 
zero properties on the market in Cary at a purchase price of $200,000. There is 1% of the available properties on the Raleigh market, sorry, the Wake County market, 81 properties countywide, and they are not located anywhere near Cary or Morrisville or Apex or any of those Western Wake towns. Similarly, for a bus driver, average starting salary 42, or starting salary 42,744. If you take that out for interest rates for a purchase price, you're looking at having about $150,000 home. It would be what you could afford with it with a typical monthly mortgage payment. Can you guess how many units? Two rental units in all of Cary at that rate. 119 units in all of Wake County. And again, you all know, even with our vacancies, we have a lot more than 119 bus drivers. For a purchase price, no property in Wake County listed at below $150,000. 66 properties in all of Wake County, and you're really getting out on the fringes in unincorporated areas to find those. So. When we look at issues like teacher recruitment, bus driver recruitment, supporting our staff, we look at the salaries for staff and the, the cost of living that drives a lot of people out of Wake County. You know, even though we don't do a lot directly around the issue of affordable housing, it affects all of us, it affects our staff, and it affects the services we can provide to our students. So I just wanted to share that. Thank you. So going around the table next, we'll go to Vice Chair Johnson Hostler. Thank you very much. I certainly echo the NC Lead training if people can attend. Um, and again, congratulations to both our principals and assistant principals uh, for their nominations. Good luck, Mr. Chair. It is, as you know, a duty. Um, one that we look forward to doing, though. Um, and also congratulations to our magnet schools, as you noted. Um, I only have one additional thing, which I will also um, let Ms. Edmonds, I'm sure she'll bring up, is um, I think the one, th there's several things I'm proud of on the board, but one of my favorite is the kindergarten kickoff, which I was really close to trying to squeeze it in on Saturday, but I made it because my favorite part is watching the kiddos do two things. One, learn how to go through the lunch line, but the second is the, the bus stop, and I always remind parents when, I, when they're, I stay at the bus stop and say, now remember, you also have to tell them you won't be riding the bus with them because parents are able to get on our bus. And so thank you to all of WCPSS staff who was there, um, our spec ed services, um, our magnet office, our CNS, which I always learn something about child nutrition when I'm there. Um, and um, we had a lot of partners, libraries were there, El Centuro was there. So it really is a great opportunity for our parents, but more importantly, um, for the little people. And um, we did miss, um, I'd be remiss if I didn't say, because they've become like family to me, um, former school board member, now Commissioner Waters, um, youngest son will be entering kindergarten and so she let me know while she was there that all the kindergartners were upcoming kindergartners were having a meltdown i apparently went before the meltdown um because they were still fun and having a great time and listing the schools that they were going to attend um so i also enjoyed the kids trying to find their school name if they knew their school name so thank you to marbles for being a great partner but more importantly thank you to all of our staff who don't always get recognized for the weekends that they do work to ensure that our community is well aware of the resources um, again we know that our educators don't just um, work when we see them in the building. Their work is continuous, as we often hear when people come to this podium, but it also is a reminder when we see them in action all day on a Saturday. So thank you. Thank you. We'll next go to Mr. Hershey. Uh, thank you. Um, let me start by saying I did not know anyone was going to mention my name at uh, public comments, and I appreciate them both. Um, uh, Clarification question: Did you say the um, semi, the, the principal and assistant principal of the year, are, is that listed on Facebook currently? Was that? Any public? It's not, but we can't get that on our website. Like, I would just like to encourage us to, like, front and center that on our website as and drive traffic to our website. I think that's always a positive. Um, and I would actually encourage some thought into when we have 
when, especially when you have comments like this, is finding a way to have your comments on um, the website so people who miss this can revisit them or take a look at them because it's a lot to absorb and to listen to and sometimes it's just easier to read them and you're always giving us a ton of great information and giving the public a, a lot of great information. Absolutely. So a couple points. Um, I, I want to say that I love the new um, agenda format because it allows me to look up the seclusion policy 4302 and see that we had not revisited it. It wasn't, re it was revised last October 3rd, 2017. Um, and so I know I, as a board member would love some information just kind of on what we're doing on that front if there's the possibility of uh, either small group discussions to, so we can get information on it as parents have been bringing this to us um, at the last couple of board meetings. Um, a couple of important notes uh, next Tuesday um, the, f the entire facilities committee uh, that consists of members on the team have really been uh, beating the drum on HVAC, and so I want to give them all credit. And next Tuesday, we're going to have the entire f facilities meeting will be on HVAC, uh, and we're going to get a lot of updates, a lot of information about um, different systems that are going to be replaced. I know it impacts a lot of our schools across the county. Um, that's and as far as reaching out and, and making sure this information gets out, um, I would like us also to think about how do we share the information that we are provided at committee meetings. Um, I, I'm going to give a shout out to uh, my colleague, Mr. Swanson, in a minute on the student achievement work that he's had in, in his committee and um, uplift some of that. And, and the eyeballs on those committees are, I mean, last the numbers I saw last week on YouTube were about 120 people who saw this, saw the presentation, and we have some amazing work going on in student achievement with academics, and I want to make sure we are centering that. Um, I do want to give a quick shout out to the Leadership uh, Academy staff uh, and Cedric Williams, the area superintendent, and uh, Principal King and Principal Walker, and uh, they've done a terrific job. They are the ones who really deserve all the credit. Um, lastly, along the lines of um, lifting up my colleague, Mr. Swanson, and the, the work that they've been doing for um, student achievement, I want to highlight one of the items, and it was uh, that Dr. Wilson Norman and her team have been working on. Um, it is the Early Learning Alignment Summit, which is supporting transitions from pre-K to kindergarten. It's the first of its kind in Wake County. Um, it's they're going to expand it next year and build on it. These are the type of, um, this is the type of work that I see as potential big game changers because as our superintendent has, has talked to us about, um, it's so vital that we are investing in pre-K, uh, not just what we can do because we really need the state to make that big investment into pre-K, but starting to align uh, and support transitions from pre-K, not just the pre-K, pre classes we have, but then reaching out to um, other pre-K centers throughout our county and working on that. I just think it, long term it's going to show tremendous results and uh, that's the kind of work that we are doing that we're not always centering um, enough for the public to see and I want to make sure that we are elevating it and, and I want to give my colleague again, Mr. Swanson, all the credit for, for bringing this to us and making sure we're getting it and now we need to make sure we do a better job of getting it out there for the public in a, in, a, in, a way, in a better way than we're doing right now. And those are my comments. Thank you. Right. Thank you, Mr. Hershey. Dr. Ring. Thank you. And uh, Dr. Taylor, um, just so you know, I've actually tried out all those fruits that you've mentioned, including the star fruit. Um, so uh, that's, it's great that the kids will be able to try out those things. Um, but uh, first of all, I want to uh, thank all the folks from the Divine Nine who came out to our last community engage engagement committee meeting last week. Um, it was a personally a good opportunity for me to learn about the history um, of the National Pan-Hellenic Council and to hear from each of the nine historically black fraternities and sororities that make up the Divine Nine. Um, and it was very encouraging to hear the level of volunteerism and uh, community engagement that had been there for many, many years, um, and um, you know, to help out the African American community. 
Um, and I, I learned that many of our staff here are part of that. So, um, and, um, but I can certainly uh, let our colleagues here uh, speak more on it. Uh, but what I was uh, wanted to kind of point out is it's a, it was a very productive meeting also because uh, we were able to connect them with our community partnership mapping initiative, um, which is a new project to compile a database of community partners. Um, so if you are a part of or you know of a nonprofit organization, religious organization, or a private foundation that would be uh, like to be added to the database, um, uh, that would be a, a great asset. Um, please search for community partnerships on the WCPSS website. Um, so we are really hoping for great things from creating some synergy uh, uh, in our efforts to help our, our students. Um, speaking of community engagement, um, this past weekend I had the opportunity to attend the John Locke Foundation second annual back to school launch party. Um, in addition to having free food and school supplies for, for the children, uh, the children had a chance to play with the, in the giant inflatable slide and bouncy castle while the parents had a chance to visit with some of the community organizations. I personally had an opportunity to chat with some uh, parents there uh, while they were eating, um, and um, it was, it was a, kind of a hot day, but uh, I think everybody had a great time. Uh, so I want to thank uh, the John Locke Foundation for that great event. Um, lastly, um, please continue to keep uh, John uh, Walter in, in your thoughts and prayers. Um, I had mentioned him last time at a board meeting, um, and if you uh, remember, uh, John sustained a traumatic brain injury shortly after graduating from Wakefield High School um, this past May. Um, he's had some miraculous improvements in the past nine weeks. Um, he's still at WakeMed at this time. Um, Mom and dad are eager for John to proceed to the next step in his recovery and to receive some much needed rehabilitation. Um, he still has a long ways to go though. Um, so there's a GoFundMe page that's already been set up to help mom and dad to pay for all the medical bills that will be coming. Um, to donate, uh, you can go to the GoFundMe website and search for Support John's Miraculous Recovery Journey. And from that page, you can also go to his Caring Bridge page so you can check out his latest um, updates on his conditions. And as of today, I searched, um, they had uh, reached $54,000 um, uh, in uh, funds raised. Uh, they actually had exceeded their $50,000 uh, goal from last time I checked, and they have um, now raised the goal to $100,000. And, and I think that that's, they're going to need every bit of it. Um, to help with uh, defraying the cost of the medical care. So please continue to pray for his recovery and please consider a monetary donation to help this family out. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ng. Ms. Edmonds. Thank you. Um, what, well, Ms. Johnson Hostler had to step out. I think she had to, anyway. But it's funny that she mentioned the agencies that were at the kickoff to kindergarten that are complementary to mine. None of mine are the same. So she and I were there. I was there in the morning. We didn't see each other. But that partnership with Marbles and this event, the kickoff to kindergarten, is incredible. And I, I didn't ask how many years we've been doing it. I know it's been going on, you know, some, a, num a number of years. This was my first time attending. And I, it was just great. And so, um, as she said, I also want to shout out um, our special education services team was there. We had uh, folks from um, Smart Start. We had people from the Family Academy uh, that we have here in Wake County Public Schools. There was um, representatives from the North Carolina 529 plan about saving for college. Wake Med was there. Um, you know, enhancing what our own child nutrition services team was doing. The North, Car um, yeah, the North Carolina Health and Human Services Department was there. I mean, it was just, um, and then I think I've got Girl Scouts under here. And just all of these materials, I, I told them I was gonna try to hold them up and fan them out. But th these were all available for families in addition to the staff that was there to talk with families. And so just a tremendous amount of helpful resources as families are sending their little ones to school for the first time. And um, I'm really glad I got to be there. I, uh, Dr. Taylor, thank you for mentioning the Magnet um, Awards. 
Uh, I wanted to shout out Vernon Malone College and Career Academy and Washington Magnet Elementary School, both, both in District 5, for getting the demonstration distinction from the Magnet Schools of America. And I want to shout out um, Principal Lacey Peckham at Middle Creek, uh, Amanda Boshoff at Athens Drive, and Julie Sexton at Combs as three of the finalists for the uh, Principal of the Year awards. I'm excited to watch that process play out. And finally, uh, I just want to give a special shout out to Swift Creek Elementary as they start the new year in a swing space over in Garner. So um, we are rebuilding that school, which is a great thing. But being in a swing space is, is always a challenge, has, a, has special challenges. And I just wanted to give them um, some, a special shout out and wish them a great school year. I know that the staff there will make it a great school year despite the location um, being a little different. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Edmonds. Ms. Mahaffey. Thank you, Chair Haggerty. Um, uh, last week, no, two weeks ago, um, Dr. Taylor and Director of the Arts, Jeremy Tucker, and I were able to go to Lufkin Road Middle School, um, where we got a tour of the school and got to see how it's working. And I just want to give a shout out to Ms. Hannah and the Lightning team for allowing us to view their space. And thank you, Dr. Taylor, for coming and seeing the magic of our year-round middle schools. Um, We've been saying this at our policy committee, but just a reminder, we have a new time at 10 a.m. Um, and so that will be, again, available on our streaming channel, both live and archived. And then um, a big shout out to Principal Hedgedis, uh, AP Patterson, and the Woods Creek Elementary School com um, community for their ribbon cutting on Friday. I'm so glad that so many board members were able to come. Our chair came on his birthday, um, even to come and see the magic um, that was going there. And they are the wizards, so they are full of magic and they are motivated with attitude. They're grounded, they are important, and they are collaborators, and that is their magical mindsets that they have. So it really is magic to see a school that's been open for a month um, begin and they are already a community and moving through it and so with that I'll say a quick welcome back next week to our traditional calendar schools get your sleeps in and enjoy your last week of vacation I know my youngest will <laughs> thank you Ms. Mahaffey we hope the parents and the students get some sleep before that. <laughs> we'll come back around over here to Miss Rice Good evening, everybody. Last week, I had the privilege of attending back to school rallies in District 4. I was honored to attend NLO alumni coach Lavelle Moten of Lavelle Cares Foundation, hosted at the Wake County Boys and Girls Club on Raleigh Boulevard. Coach Moten served over 1,200 Wake County students with back to school supplies, bounce houses, and summer treats. This was the 15th year of this back to, um, backpack giveaway. During the rallies, I also met a current rising 11th grade Enlow High School student, um, Matthew Nielsen, and his proud parents, um, who is part of the Evolve Mentoring led by Tulipay Omakaye. Evolve Mentoring's James Baldwin Book Club is producing dynamic student authors. Uh, Matthew wrote Restore the Heart. Um, I don't know if my picture's here. I'm missing my picture. But there we go now. Yes. I'm excited. So um, Matthew Nielsen um, and his parents um, are part of the Evolve Mentoring led by Tulipe Omakaye, Evolve Mentoring's Jane Baldwin Book Club. It's producing dynamic student authors. Matthew wrote, Restore the Heart. I purchased and received a signed copy of this graphic novel. These students took the lead in creating an incredible story that also addressed issues facing their everyday lives, like bullying. This book can be used as a social emotional learning tool to help youth unpack and discuss their feelings about difficult subjects. Matthew is one of the multiple student authors in Evolve, Evolve's Jane Baldwin's book club. Inside the book are the bios 
of our newly published young authors. So please consider purchasing Restore the Heart from Amazon to support these amazing Wake County students. Um, unfortunately, I left my copy at home with my 11th grader um, for his weekly read, for his weekly book read. But I was really excited to meet this young man and his family doing dynamic things at Inlow High School. Um, so this leads me to our eight dimensions of wellness focus today, intellectual wellness. As we prepare for our traditional students to return for the 24-25 school year, on intellectual wellness tip for the students and staff is to schedule regular learning breaks throughout the day. These breaks can involve activities like reading a chapter of a book, listening to an educational podcast, or even engaging in a creative hobby that stimulates the mind. By dedicating time to activities that challenge the brain, individuals can enhance their cognitive abilities, reduce stress, and maintain a healthy balance between work and personal growth. Use these tips to improve your intellectual wellness to have a positive and productive day. Miss Rice, raising the game, president of the AV Club. <laughs> Much appreciated, kudos to you. Miss Caulfield, before you begin, I need to ask everybody's indulgence for just one second, okay? I just noticed that and wanted to get that fixed before the end of the meeting. So, <laughs> all right, so now <laughs> you were correctly identified, but unfortunately, I didn't get your name tag in time, but we did get Miss Caulfield's replaced there. All right, apologies for the disruption but anytime you're ready. Okay. Thank you. Um, I had hoped that we could have a conversation um, because the topic, it, I think it's a topic that um, deserves our time and our consideration, but since it didn't happen, I hope that we can discuss it in the next meeting with more detail. Um, but I had asked for it to, for us to be able to speak about that and discuss either a possible repeal um, for the updates on Title IX change or to hold off until the, co the courts had settled it because we now have 26 states and 62 of our schools so far and that's still ongoing. There's so much that's changing um, and there are people that are still trying to join and into that fight against these Title IX changes. The Supreme Court just ruled in favor of not allowing Biden administration to overturn the enjoyment and agreed that there was constitutional value in the injunction therefore preventing schools from enforcing the new rule. So there's plenty to discuss so that I, I hope that we would be able to bring that back and have that conversation about since the Supreme Court had that ruling what does that mean for us and what does that look like going forward. I would also like to ask the board that we put on the calendar a conversation that discusses how we can incorporate the safety and privacy through either single stall bathrooms or implementing separate rooms for private for privacy reasons for those students that are identifying as trans and seeking privacy or safe spaces as we heard from our families no one should be discriminated against nor bullied but putting these things in place to have these safe spaces can be a solution so that they experience no harm I feel that we need to have a real conversation about how to make that happen. If the objective, if the objective is safe and, s safe and private spaces, all students should have that. And we should not sacrifice one safety over another. We can do both. If the goal is safety and safe spaces, there are ways that we can provide these students with either bathrooms and ways that we can provide either separate overnight stay rooms just changing areas, something that gives them and allows them to have that safe and private space. And I'll repeat my concern that this policy does not in fact protect trans students. It does open the doors to put biological girls and trans students in harm's way. We need to have a conversation to find these spaces for both trans and for both girls. And we should and could do both. Um, 
there's a couple of dates that are coming up for in District 1. Our board advisory meeting, our first one is coming up on September 23rd, and we will have the honor of Dr. Taylor joining us to talk about his first year with us and his plan for Wake County going forward. Um, I also wanted to mention that um, we have some other, act some other activities that are coming up in our district. Mental health has many faces. It could be depression or anxiety. It could be temporary or ongoing. It can be unclear and affects everyone around us. Mental health also means well-being and finding ways to achieve your goals. As we continue to seek many ways to connect our community to conquer the challenges around mental health, whether it be our family, a student, or staff, we need to continue to find ways to spread this awareness, to support each other, and find ways to heal. There's many sort resources, and I'm glad to see our communities and towns are coming together to find many ways to battle mental health and to get organizations and community members to partner with our schools. We did hear about the great community involvement from the Divine Nine. It was great to hear about that, um, as Dr. Ng had, had mentioned. There were organizations reaching out to our facilities committee meeting, I mean, from our, our facilities committee meeting regarding our angel funds and inquiring how they could help. Mar Marbles partnered with our kindergarten, and Saturday I was able to meet um, some great families through the John Locke Foundation. They had the school supply giveaway. They gave away backpa backpacks that were filled with school supplies to get our students ready for the year ahead. And I met a lot of young students that were very excited to start school. It's a great way to engage and partner with our community members, and I'm glad that we are hearing a lot of different ways that that could happen. In District 1, there are two events that are coming up. In Wake Forest, September 28th from 1 to 4 p.m. at the Renaissance Center, they are having a mental wellness fair. And in Wendell, on September 21st, the communities at the Wendell Community Center between 10 and 2, they are having a community event called Wendell Whole Health Resource and Family Fun Day. That is also on a Saturday. And finally, I would like to wish all of those traditional school families a happy and successful new year starting next week. Thank you, Ms. Caulfield. And you know, I was so excited that I was going to be the first one to announce my BAC meeting this year, and I completely overlooked it. So I, I appreciate the reminder. I can't claim first. But District 7 will also have our first BAC member, BAC meeting, on um, Wednesday, September 4th at Austin Ridge Elementary School. So thank you for that reminder. I thought I was going to get in there first, but I missed my opportunity. Mr. Swanson. Thank you. See, I planned my BAC meetings for the year, but just didn't announce them or the schools yet. So that'll be coming soon, but it will not be in September. Um, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, for subbing in for me on at the Western Wake Town Hall. Um, I will do my due diligence to get those slides uh, to the board and to the community. Um, and great that I, I think it's just important for us and when we started having these town halls we wanted to highlight the relationships and the uh, interlocking work that the county commissioner plays the state legislator and the board because all of our work connects and so I have to give a great um, great uh, thank you to uh, Senator Adcock and Commissioner Stallings um, for their partnership and uh, and continuing these so we will continue these uh, in the months ahead. So let me get back to my prepared remarks. Um, I also want to thank my Rotary Club, the Cary Rotary Club, for hosting a very successful book bash uh, for parents and for K through five students to get the opportunity to grab a book and read a book uh, before the school year kicked off. And so we had some outstanding special readers, uh, which included our uh, Wake County Principal of the Year, Ms. Winston Pierce. Our Teacher of the Year, Mr. Uh, Ryan uh, Berglick. I'm sure I just butchered his name, so please forgive me. A um, couple of electeds, Councilwoman um, Jennifer uh, Roberts from the Cary Town Council, our Mayor T.J. Colley, uh, Representative Maria Cervania, and um, Mr. Alan Howell, who is a well-known storyteller. And we had a very special, special guest which was uh, canine officer Clyde and Cary Police Department Corporal Brad Fletcher, which it was extremely hard to follow those two. Um, 
you never read after a, a dog has come because you've lost all of their attention. Um, and so I really want to thank all those volunteers who helped collect the books. And a special thank you to Dr. Hendrick um, and former, former principal of, of uh, Green Hope and former board member uh, Bill Fletcher for their advocacy and, and passion for literature and making sure that our kids are able to read. Um, and I also want to say a welcome back to all of our traditional educators who started this week. Uh, the school year is getting ready to kick off, so I wish you all the best, um, and to our students and, and families. And also to our first year teachers, just want to thank you for stepping up and stepping into this new role, and I'm sure as a former Beginning teacher, I understand the, the challenges and the nervousness that goes with it, but the best advice that I received from a, a, a great teacher was to just be yourself and build those relationships, and everything else falls into place. So don't worry about all the nonsense that comes along with it. Everything will fall in play, but, but put your relationships with your students first. Build with those relationships and families, and everything comes together. And lastly, I will just say, uh, Mr. Hershey, um, thank you. And I also just want to thank uh, Dr. Wilson Norman and her team for really being intentional and, and all those folks in the district office um, that shows every day that we take academics seriously. Um, we understand and we know that this work is important. Um, every, ch every child, every student, despite their area code, despite where they come from has the ability to learn and can learn. And so our, um, we have some great things planned for this upcoming student achievement. And you know, really just to show that, yes, we are pushing the needle forward on proficiency. Uh, and we're pushing back on those, those misinformation that we are not taking this stuff seriously um, because we are. And so just stay tuned. And I'm sure we are going to be leveling up as a district. And Ms. Rice has leveled us up in our comments. So. Um, <laughs> That just reminds me to take more photos when I'm out in the community so I can do uh, slides just as well. So thank you and thank you. And um, those are all my comments. Great. Great. Thank you, right. Mr. Swanson. Um, one thing also Ms. Ca Ms. Caulfield had mentioned that did come out of our joint meeting was talking about the angel funds. And you remember we had a good discussion about this. For those that don't know, um, we have our free and reduced lunch program, but sometimes their children that come to school that don't have money that either aren't part of the program or haven't qualified with the program but still have need or are still hungry and what can we do to help feed those children and those needs and so many schools have or well, I think all schools may have angel fund accounts some are funded more robustly than others and one of the things that we've been working on has been trying to get as you mentioned like a you know, donations from the community so that uh, particularly where schools have used all of their funds and those funds are empty, that we can accept more private donations. There's a lot of charitable organizations that are interested in supporting that work. Um, we may not have an update at this meeting, but I can promise that by our next meeting, we will have an update for everyone with just confirming that number, confirming it's operational, and then any additional information that might be helpful to members of the community who are interested in helping out those kids that may not have um, a hot meal for breakfast or for lunch. Dr. Taylor, did you have anything to add to that? I think uh, Mark Strickland has something he wants to share. So, Mark. So the, the, the plane is rolling on the runway. Uh, uh, you know, we just had this conversation in earnest uh, last week at the County Commissioner Joint Meeting. And so I, I just got off the phone with Paula DeLuca, and we've had a lot of interest. Um, a lot of people have, have reached out and are interested in participating. But again, this is just starting to roll out. So um, I, I don't have any figures to report, as, as you all would like to hear right now. But I can say that not only through the efforts last week and the conversations that took place at that meeting, uh, we've had other opportunities to talk with other community partners, and Paula is, is working that as well, and we fully believe that this will be fruitful in, in, in short order. So I wish I had some numbers, but that's hot off the press. You know, Mr. Strickland, for it not being an agenda topic, you have performed admirably. So thank you so much. Thank you for the update, and we do, we, we do look forward to hearing more about this. I think it is a priority we've all identified on the board. Ms. Caulfield? And he ran 
ran away. <laughs> but I just wanted to say, um, just we've talked about you know consistency and communication, and we we say those words a lot. But this really shows. I mean, it's great news that you've had a lot of interest from our uh, county commissioner, and we've we've talked about it in facilities, and then the commissioners meeting, and that's really awesome that that many people are reaching out each time that we talk to them. We're getting better news coming back from it, and I just think it's just uh, it just shows how great and the power of communication getting out to those people are. So that's awesome to hear that more people are interested. All right. So at that point, at this point on our agenda, um, we turn to our business agenda, which is very, very brief. Um, we have our consent agenda before us. Do we have a motion, Mr. Swanson? Mr. Chair, I move that we adopt the uh, agenda. Um, I'd also like to include the HR um, pieces in there as well if that's the appropriate time for that or we can do that um, we could either um, because we've concluded our closed closed session business so we could just to present you with some options we could do one motion to adopt the consent the items on the consent agenda or we could have a motion to adopt the items on the consent agenda and also to approve the HR uh, recommendations and appointments that were reviewed in closed session I'm, I'm looking at mr. Malone yes. So it's up to you. It's at your discretion. Second option. All right. Second. So we have a combined option <laughs> from Mr. Swanson that was seconded in record time by Mr. Hershey to approve the items on our consent agenda, and everyone sees those, and then also to approve the HR recommendations and appointments and those items that um, were presented in closed session. Uh, we have a prop. We have a we have a motion. It's been properly moved and seconded. All in favor of adoption of the consent agenda items and the HR recommendations, signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right. Those items have been adopted. Well, now, you know, this would be the, a point in time where if we'd had additional public comment, you know, beyond the time limit, we would have that now. Uh, then we would move to closed session, which we do not have. So, Mr. Hershey, do you have a motion? What, do we have any settlements, announcement of settlements? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Hershey. All right. Here, just pass that down to Sam. I'm gonna... <laughs> <laughs> um, we have four announcements tonight um, in the matter of KR by parent or guardian DRB Wake County Board of Education. 24 EDC 01130. Um, the petitioner agreed to release all claims against the board that were brought or could have been brought pursuant to the IDEA and North Carolina special education statutes in exchange for non monetary terms and payment of up to $38,915. In HR V. Wake County Board of Education 24 CV 07139. Um, um, this is a student matter that was resolved prior to the filing of an actual complaint for non monetary terms and includes a dismissal and release of all claims that could have been brought. In AH by and through her mother RP v. the Wake County Board of Education 24 EDC 01190, the board entered into a settlement agreement with AH by and through her mother in the amount of $19,274 in other non monetary terms. And in Cooper Tackier General Contracting Company v. Wake County, v. the County of Wake, the Wake County Board of Education, and the Wake County Public School System, 24 CV 08745. The board entered into a settlement agreement with Cooper Tackier in the amount of $620,000. $526, but this amount was all part of the actual contract balance and did not include new funds. 
that would be the end of the settlements. Thank you, Mr. Malone. So if you ever wondered what happens after closed session when we come back, but before we adjourn, that's it. All right, then, motion Mr. Hershey. Adjourn. We have a motion to adjourn. Is there a second? Second from Ms. Mahaffey. All in favor of adjournment, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right, the meeting is adjourned. Thank you, everybody.